Hey everybody, how's it going? And welcome back. Uh, I just finished the Wheel of Time season one finale, and I have to say it was really good. Uh, let's go ahead and just jump on into it. So first, we're opened with uh, you know the crew uh, still in Faldara and Rand and Moraine trekking through the blight. And, of course, that is all. Uh, everyone is worried about Rand and Moraine. Lan is pretty pretty distraught that he can't sense Moraine because she's masked the bond. So she's out there, and he doesn't know what she's doing for the first time in a long time. Uh, of course, all the Emmons fielders are worried about Rand because he, he is uh, the dragon, and they've just found out about this. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely got some tension right there at the beginning. So as Rand and Moraine are trekking through the blight, we get a dream sequence, essentially, of Rand meeting Ishamael for the first time. And man, was that meeting just everything I wanted it to be. I, uh, Faris Faris, the guy who, who played Ishamael in this episode, you're, you're a show stealer, a scene stealer. Um, I think you were... Your your brother is the guy who made that game, uh, like Brothers, and then the the Prism one, right? The two those two air, two player co op games. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, I thought I kind of recognized you from somewhere, but good job. Uh, you're killing it as my personal favorite Forsaken. Uh, and I just have to say, like the entire uh, Ishamael aesthetic of him still being in like Age of Legends clothing, uh, was was really good. Now it was a little obviously it is different from the other world in this respect because Ishmael is just batshit crazy <laughs> in, in that book and the subsequent two and he's really sane here like he's more like Moradin in a lot of regards not that Moradin is sane necessarily but anyway uh this is oh I should have mentioned this is full spoilers by the way just so you know so yeah uh I mean overall like the beats of the story that we hit throughout this episode uh like, just followed so well. that I do have some gripes that I'm going to get to, but let me just finish my praise. Um, of course, the cinematography has been stellar in this show so far, and this episode is not really any exception to that. Uh, in fact, it had some of the best, I think, of the season, so they've got that going for them. That's really good. One thing I thought was weird, I didn't hate it, I just thought it was weird, was the relationship with Agamar and his sister. That was kind of yeah, I mean, we didn't really get them all that developed in in the books, and so having them develop it just a little bit more was kind of strange. Um, and uh, it was also weird to see the rest of the Two Rivers crew go back to talk to Min to find out what she saw, because obviously that didn't happen. And I was just, I guess they like their their thinking was, like, oh, we're just gonna figure out what she saw, and then you know. I, this is this is where being a book reader has like a little bit of that like it's harder to suspend uh what they're doing here because i'm like well men's men's visions like you know they don't make sense till you finish the series basically or until after the events that she sees happen so yeah it was just really for me it was bizarre and then i kind of sat back and thought about it a little bit more i was like ah, i guess that makes sense that's fine so anyway, yeah, we swap back and forth between Faldara and the Blight with Rand and Moraine's uh, trek here, and they are walking through the Blight, and I just, do y'all get this sense that it looks like Dagobah, or like the Swamp of Sorrows from the NeverEnding Story, because that's exactly what I'm getting here, and I'm just like waiting on them to come across Atreyu and Artax sinking into the mud, and uh, for, for them to just like make me relive my childhood trauma from that movie. Um, and then it's like the other the other thing you could turn around and half expect them to see Luke and Yoda trying to raise an X wing out of the swamp. So yeah, I definitely got uh, '80s movies vibes from The Blight, which for me is a big plus. Uh, you know, it's the movies I grew up on, especially early childhood, and just the visual aesthetic and everything was very pleasing to me. Um, as they approach the eye of the world. Uh, we notice some things are not quite the same as they were in the books. Like, obviously, the eye is like a pocket reality or dimension or shielded area within the Blight that is cared for by Shemeshta, a.k.a. the Green Man, uh, and who's basically an int, by the way, for those of you who don't know. He's, he's essentially uh, an int uh, in terms of Lord of the Rings comparisons. But yeah, uh, so... That area is watched over by him, and it's green and verdant, and it's very nice, and there's a pool of completely pure Sidene there. Uh, that was all absent from this as well, so just completely strange. 
Like, uh, n- not that the end of the Eye of the World isn't strange. Like, in the context of the rest of the Wheel of Time series, it's extremely weird and bizarre. Uh, and it's th- there's a lot of things that happen in there that don't necessarily make sense until you finish the entire series. So it, it's just a weird, it's a weird ending. <laughs> Just like this is, actually. I'm still trying to fathom, like, what's what's really going on here. So, anyway, uh, we go down into the eye, which could be the boar, actually, that they had drilled to the Dark One's prison. Um, we don't know for sure, for certain, but uh, it's, it's very clear that, at least it was very clear to me that Ishamael wanted Rand to channel in here for some reason. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty sure that he wanted him to, to cause some damage and destruction, which would then weaken that seal. And it's just, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out the play here, which, I mean, I spent a lot of years trying to figure out the end of the eye of the world too. So this is going to be a lot to talk about. Uh, moving back to Faldaro, uh, as the Trollocs are approaching, we get all that stuff between Agamar and his sister, and then we get the Immensfield kids arguing about whether or not they should leave or stay and help. And so, obviously, Nynaeve and Egwene uh, sign up to go help uh, Lady Amalisa channel and defend Faldara from the uh, approaching Trollocs. So they link with her, and and then she cha- she basically pulls all the power she can from them, which with Egwene and Nynaeve is a bunch. And we see these channeling women, who are not Aes Sedai necessarily, uh, start to burn out. And we saw with one of men's visions that Nen was going to burn out. Okay, so we're getting into something I didn't like here, which was this Nen fake out. Like, did anyone actually think, I want to know, show only watchers, did any of y'all actually think that Nynaeve was going to die here? Because I feel like this is just kind of dumb. Like they and they did this a little bit with Land too in episode four. They go, they go a little too far with these like injuries that look like they should be fatal. Um, you know, it's it's just a little too. They're going overboard with some of this stuff. And I kind of knew like from the moment Nine fell over because she didn't turn to ash like literally everybody else did. She was still a solid human. That I kind of knew that Egwene would heal her. Um, but it's just it it wasn't satisfactory right like this is probably one of my biggest gripes with season one and considering that i haven't had a lot this is i you know i i was kind of mad on the gateway to in episode six i was kind of mad on the love triangle and now i'm kind of mad on this so for the last three episodes i've not really been super hot on some of these choices they've made with with other things that they're doing but you know it's not ruining it for me it's just leaving me scratching my head and feeling that these are like slightly convenient things. Now, in defense of the writers, Jordan did tons of things based out of convenience in the books. Like, there are things that happen off screen that are hyper convenient for the plot. The characters are all extremely talented and powerful and like superhuman individuals. So, you know, it, it's not really like a fault of their own. Though you can always. There are arguments to be made about why they're superhuman, right? Like, because they would live through a whole, like, utopian age of legends where the one power was used to bolster and and strengthen humanity as a whole. People used to live, regular people used to live for, like, a long time. And so, you know, it makes sense that even regular humans are probably superior physically to anyone in the first age. Um, But, yeah... I did not really care for that. I thought it was just a little too overdone. And then it was like a no fanfare when Egwene healed her almost. It just was so blah to me. I, you know, to each their own. Uh, someone on Twitter, I think it was at Uno's Eye Patch, did say that this would be good to set up 90s fear of the, of the power for her block. I'm like, <sighs> I said I disagreed initially. And the more I've thought on it, yes, I can see that for sure, but I still don't like it. I think they could have done it without, like, overkill. Like, there's just, it's too overkill, is my thing. Like, she could have almost burned out. They literally showed, like, almost showed her completely burned out. Like, dead. And, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it, and it's like Perrin killing his wife. You know, he could have just killed his brother. He could have just killed his master. No, he killed his wife. You know, I mean, obviously that does set up things for his arc later on down the line, just like those does set up things for Nynaeve's arc 
later on down the line. But still, like, can we? They're at about an eight. Can I pull them back to about a six? Like, it we can we can do these things and still have trauma associated with them, right? So I don't know. It's just maybe I'll feel better about it on a rewatch. But that's where I'm sitting at right now. I did not like it, and we'll have to wait and see. I. Full disclosure, I have felt better about most everything else on rewatches too, so if that gives you any indication. Um, so Rand's whole battle with Shishamael at the end, I loved it. Uh, I think book readers in general are going to like that because it really, to me, that captures the spirit of what Rand's ultimate true struggle is um, within the Wheel of Time, right? Like, he has this near godlike... Uh, role to play like he's basically an avatar of of the creator and so he has this responsibility this role to play and he constantly has these thoughts and doubts and desires about how he should go about fighting evil in the world and like what he should do to make sure it doesn't come back and i think for sure for rand like this battle with ishamael with this idyllic life that he could have had uh it, it was absolutely perfect, and book readers are going to see a lot of parallels between that and another specific scene in the books, and I'm not going to go into any more detail if you're a show-only watcher watching this. So, But yeah, that's my thoughts. That's my feelings. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap the video here. Go ahead, give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel for more Wheel of Content from me. Uh, go check out my other episode reviews, reactions, and recaps. I don't have a number seven yet because my parents were in town last week and I haven't gotten around to recording it. And at this point, I'm not sure I will, so we'll see. Uh, but yes, uh, do all that. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Red Ham Bard. And as always, I will catch you all next time. Peace.